Jamie from Stonemeyer Games, and I'm back for another chapter, chapter four of my virtual live book club for a crowdfunder strategy guide. For the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about chapter four in the book, which is called I Made These Mistakes So You Don't Have To, which pretty much sums up the entire reason why I wrote this book and why I write my crowdfunding blog, because I've learned a lot of things the hard way over the last nine, ten years, coming up on ten years. And I'd rather you learn from my, my mistakes so you don't have to make those same mistakes in the future. Um, hey, Chris, thanks for popping in. So today I will be talking about this chapter. It's okay if you haven't read this chapter. I'm going to go over all the all the different things that happen in this chapter that I that I discuss and some other notes to update this chapter for 2022 because I wrote this back in like 2014. If you have any questions along the way or comments, feel free to chime in. I'm, I'm eager to hear your thoughts and questions along the way. So... The very first part of the chapter is I list the top 10 most common crowdfunding mistakes back in 2014. So let's go over these real quick and then I will let you know if I still agree with them. Uh, launching without a crowd. Yeah, definitely still a mistake. If you launch your project and you haven't already uh, told people that you're going to launch and no one knows about it, that's a mistake. Hey, Matthew Garrett, Chad, thanks for joining in today. Uh, mistake number two, minimal conversation. Uh, I say the creator does not actively engage his or her backers during the campaign through comments, project updates, and polls. I still think that I, I do agree that that is still a mistake. Um, I Back then, I think it was more common to see a project go live, and then you just wouldn't hear anything from the creator at all for a couple days, if not the entire project. Um, that is definitely a problem, too. Still a problem. Still a mistake to make. Poor demonstration. Uh, definitely, I'll come back to that in a second in my with my current top five list. Unappealing reward structure. Definitely still agree with this too. Whether it's the structure of the reward of the rewards themselves or the, the the value that you are giving for the price that you're charging, I think that's still a big big problem. Expensive shipping rates. Um, this is an interesting one because shipping is uh, has changed a lot over the last six years. Uh, what is it? Eight years since I wrote this book. Um, now, a lot of things are shipped from different fulfillment centers around the world. That was not as common back in 2014. And shipping is more expensive today, that I think, than it ever was. But more so than ever before, shipping is now charged after the campaign and not during the campaign. And so shipping might be expensive, but backers don't always think about it as much until after the campaign. So I don't know if I would put that at the top of this list. Um, inaccurate funding goal. That one is still important. Um, that have, selecting the, the right funding goal. Sometimes we see products go too high, sometimes too low. That can throw off backers. I don't know if it's a deal breaker level mistake. Pushy promotional approach. Um, yeah, this is, this. I guess it's a small concern. I don't know if I'd put it in the top 10 mistakes anymore uh, because we do see creators talking about their, their, pro, their crowdfunding campaigns on social media. And I think the way that you do that can attract or... Uh, dissuade backers from, from joining your project, but I don't know if it's a huge mistake if you do that a little bit too much. Uninspired and unvetted product. That's definitely true. So this goes into like, do you have third-party reviews? Do those reviewers like the product? Um, is it original? Is it innovative? You know, all those things that go into it, that is still a big problem. Too many project updates. I, don't, I definitely wouldn't put that on the top 10 now. Uh, I, I, sometimes we see projects with a project update every day, and yes, that can discourage backers from actively reading and participating in those project updates, but I don't know if it's a deal breaker level mistake. And uh, hey, George, thanks for popping in. And everything is too long. What did I say here? The duration of the project is too long, more than 35 days, and thus lacks urgency. The project page is filled with lengthy information that could be condensed. The project video is more than two minutes. I can see that. I'll come back to that in a little bit later in this discussion. Um, I think those things are important, but I don't know if I would put it in the top 10. So let me jump back to my list right here because I recently did a blog post about my top five, what I think are the top five mistakes made today. And uh, rather than doing a top 10, the top five that I view today are launching too soon. And this ties back to not having um, a, not having a, a crowd built up of, of eager people to check out your project. Hey, Kai, thanks for popping in. Um, so that's still a problem. And launching too soon, I've, I've still, I still hear creators saying, you know, um, I sent games to reviewers, but uh, reviewers didn't, um, uh, they haven't, they didn't have much time and they haven't had time to create content for the game yet, but I'm going to go ahead and launch anyway. That never makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Like wait until those reviewers have, uh, have are ready to start talking about your product and then launch. So launching too soon. 
Uh, number four, lack of details and reviews. That ties back to what I just said a little bit, but lack of details. This goes into like, do you, if you're launching a game campaign, is the rule book ready or at least a rule book that you can share with people, even if that rule book will change over time or will look a lot better over time. Um, uh, details, any, any details about how the thing works. People need to know those details if they're going to decide to back it. Number three, no hook. I, we see so many projects launched these days, uh, especially board game projects, that if there isn't a hook, something to draw people in um, on multiple levels, a mechanical hook, a thematic hook, a, uh, um, an aesthetic hook, um, if, if those hooks aren't there, I, I, I think that's one of the major reasons that, that projects fail. And poor aesthetics and presentation. I think this is still the number one reason that a great project, a project with all four of those other things, can fail if the presentation of the product and the project page itself are really poor, unfortunately. Um, but I think those, those are the top five. Um, I mentioned this chapter. I go into this a little bit later. I talk about the importance of paying and vetting uh, art and graphic design. I think that is still really, really important to this day, even more important to this day that uh, if you're trying to save a little bit of money by doing the graphic design yourself or by doing the art yourself or having a friend whose art that you kind of enjoy do it so that you don't have to pay as much, it is the one area that can truly tank your project. I think it is worth paying the money and it's worth getting opinions early on as to whether or not the art that you are selecting and the graphic design that you're going with is, is appealing to other people, that you don't have a blind spot for it. As creators, I think we end up having blind spots. When someone creates art for something that we have been passionately working on, there's a part of us, I think, that that has a blind spot to it and wants that art to be good, especially if we've started paying for it already. But that's the moment where I think it's crucially important to vet that art or graphic design with other some someone who is not as closely tied to the project um, to get their opinions about it, just in case you are making a mistake and you need to find a better artist or a better graphic designer. I see some comments over here. Let me check out. Uh, Michael says, De definitely need to have previews and reviews before you launch. Glad we had a few for On the Rocks, Michael's campaign On the Rocks. Matthew says, what are some examples of good hooks in some recent games that you've seen on Kickstarter? That's a great question, Matthew. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, who asked it? Yeah, Matthew did ask that. Okay. Um, so one of the games that I recently backed on Kickstarter was uh, from designers Matthew... O'Malley and Ben Rossa, two designers that I've worked with. It's called First in Flight. And uh, what were the hooks for it? I, I, I love the look of the board. It had this board where the victory track is going one way and then you're trying to get your airplane to fly 36 meters and that, that makes you the first in flight. And so there's this other track going the other way. Just the whole presentation of the board really hooked me in. I, I don't know if it was a wholly original board. It's a nice looking game board, but there's something about it that looks good that showed me that a lot of time and attention to detail went into that board. The push or luck mechanism in it stood out, out to me that um, on certain turns, you were just going to decide, okay, I'm going to try to take my airplane out and fly it. And just kind of the idea of the, the core idea of the game, I, I just really enjoyed that you are trying to get some points, but the, the the primary goal that you're trying to do, in fact, I'm not even sure now that I say that if there are victory points in the game, there's a there's a time track, but there's also this flight track. Um, but just the, the core idea that what you're trying to do is have a flight that gets you up to 36 meters. And it just so it was more, more of a mechanical hook for me in that game than anything else, but also that everything else supported that. That was something that definitely stood out. Anyone else can chime in too. If you've seen a game that hooked you for a certain reason or any product on Kickstarter or GameFound or even BackerKid is now doing the crowdfunding um, that hooked you in, let me know in the comments here. George says, what major difficulties have you encountered with Euphoria or what major difficulties did I encounter with Euphoria on Kickstarter? Anything that comes to mind in particular? Let me see if I did have anything. So I talk about some mistakes in this chapter. Let me see what happened with Euphoria. Um... I don't know if I talked about Euphoria specifically too much in this chapter, so I might try to remember if I can think of anything. So many of my mistakes that I talk about in here happened on Viticulture. Yeah, a lot of things with Viticulture. Um, so I, there's one little thing that happens later in the chapter that I talk about, and that is the length of the video. Um, over time, I have been an advocate for a shorter project video, only around a minute, 60 to 90 seconds, I think is kind of the sweet spot. And if you want to have a longer thematic trailer or a longer preview or anything like that, to put it lower down on the project page, 
Um, I don't even know anymore how many people actually watch the video. I only sometimes watch it as a backer myself, but I know that if it's, if I click on that video and it starts playing and it's like a five minute video, I'm a lot less likely to even continue watching it. Cause I'm like, how is this going to hook me in for a full five minutes? But if it's only 60 seconds, then I'm more likely to, to stay at least for the first 10 seconds for it to hook me in very short attention span or, uh, retention time that you have for, for grabbing someone's attention on a video. So for euphoria, the playing time was three minutes. So I think that was, that was too long for a video. That was a mistake that I made there. I'll go back to some other mistakes in a second that I talk about throughout this chapter. There are quite a few, especially for viticulture. Um, I do talk about partnership a little bit here too. I'll talk about that in a second. Chad says, uh, graphic design on the actual Kickstarter page is so important to look like a pro versus someone selling from the garage. Definitely. Yeah, you, can, you can't even tell the difference there. If you have someone selling from the garage, which could be the case, some creators still do ship out things from the garage, but if they have a beautiful project page, you don't really think about that. Um, Garrett says, recently I've seen some projects fund instantly or quickly within a couple days, but end up getting canceled because the publisher was hoping for more explosive success. It seems like setting a funding goal too low can still be a big issue. I'm sure a ton of factors go into that calculation. Yeah, I've, seen, I've even seen that Garrett for, uh, not going to name the project, but there was a project that had a funding goal of like $100,000. And I think they raised around 300000 but it wasn't what they hoped it would be. Um, I, I heard the creator talk about that and it wasn't so much, according to him, it wasn't so much about the funding total as it was um, the types of conversations that were happening during the project. He, I, I think he said he focused on the wrong thing during the project. So I don't know if that was about, about the funding goal, but I have seen some projects do what you just described there. Abel says, what if you are a graphic designer and want to make a game? Totally fine. I think that's that's great if you are a graphic designer and you have that talent. I would still recommend, um, so here's what I would recommend doing because I have seen, and I, I want to say this delicately, but I've seen many artists in particular, maybe not necessarily graphic designers, I know they're two separate things, but I have seen many artists who are really, really happy with their art. And I love that for them on a personal level. But, um, Sometimes I don't think it is, I don't think it's very good art. Um, and I know that's highly subjective, but I think basically we all have our own blind spots, whether it's, as I described before, someone that you've paid to do some art for you or a friend and you have your blind spot because they're your friend and you want them to make awesome art, they're a family member, or if they're yourself, I have my own blind spots as a designer and a developer and as a publisher, I do. And so I try to hold myself accountable by having a bunch of other people around me that don't always just agree with me and that I can throw stuff at them and say, Hey, is this actually good? Tell me the truth. This is important that you tell me the truth. And so one thing I would recommend for you, for any artist or graphic designers who, who want to launch a Kickstarter campaign or a crowdfunding campaign, um, share samples of your art or graphic design as if they aren't your own. So post them on uh, uh, somewhere on Facebook on a, on a page where you can get some feedback or a group where you can get some feedback and say, Hey, here's the artist I'm hoping to work with, or here's the graphic designer that I'm hoping to work with, even though it's actually you and ask people what they think. And you will get the most honest answers. You may not like those answers, but that's the time to get it right. Um, that's the time to get those answers. And what might end up happening, uh, this might sting a little bit about if, if that happens, but uh, what it might end up happening, I hope this isn't the case with you, but if someone ever tries that method and they get the feedback where people are saying that it just isn't good enough, that the, this graphic design, this art would not draw them to a campaign, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't have to participate as a graphic designer. You still have skills that you can apply to the project. Um, and same as an artist, you still have, you, you've developed all these skills, you can still apply them to the, to the project, but you might not be the primary artist for it. You might just go in and hone some things and tweak some things or be the creative art director. Um, instead, that's a long answer to your question, but I'm, I think it's so important. I think it's so, so important. And that's why I spent a little extra time on it there. Cynthia says uh, about the funding goal. I wish creators would just set the goal to the real number that they need to have, uh, to complete the project, whatever that number is. I do think more and more, um, in fact, I think I say this in the book, I talk about setting a lower than necessary funding goal so you can quickly overfund, but more and more, I agree totally with what, uh, Cynthia and Garrett are getting out there that having an accurate funding goal. Uh, one that you are happy with as a creator to actually go ahead and make the product uh, is 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 really important because if you if you do somehow fund or overfund and you still cancel you're going to lose a lot of trust you're going to lose a lot of backer trust especially if you even if you try to relaunch later 
George says, for the original video culture Kickstarter, I saw there was a tier where you could go to, where you would go deliver the game in person. Did that happen eventually? Those were the real old Kickstarter days and some really nice rewards. So yes, that's some of the stuff that I wanted to talk about in the chapter today. I had some weird stuff on that original 2012 Viticulture campaign, including what you just described, um, a level, as far as I can remember, where I would go teach the game to someone. Um, and that is, I, I think, a little bit of a precarious reward to offer people. Um, it can take a lot of time to do that. And you never really know if strangers are signing up for you. You never really know um, who you're going to have to go teach that to teach the game to. So uh, th I think that I did do it once. A friend actually did uh, back that level and, um, and, and had me do it. And I had a good time with it, with, with that particular friend. But if it had been a stranger, it might have been a little weird. It might have been awkward, a little awkward. In fact, I might have even done it with someone else, too. But I remember that one, the one friend... Um, who was very supportive of the project. I really do appreciate that. I do see some other comments. So let me jump back to them in a second. Let me see what I'm missing right now so far. One thing I do talk about in the chapter is partnership. The, the value of having a partner, I, I don't think can be underestimated. Um, I did not have a partner for a little while going into the project. I was just designing Viticulture on my own. And my friend, Alan, happened to be one of the friends who I tapped into as a play tester. And he just enjoyed the playtesting process and ended up being the co-founder of the company. But really for a long time, he was essentially my lead playtester. He was someone I could go to without feeling guilty about asking for their time to playtest the game because I knew he was excited about it, as excited as I was. And so um, I really found a lot of value in that partnership. As someone who really enjoys working alone, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed having someone that I could go to to brainstorm, to bounce stuff off of, to go to for that play testing when, when you know, the only other people in my group were friends that I could play test with at the time. Um, I, I wasn't familiar with, you know, meetup groups and other ways that you can find play testers. So that was, that was super helpful. So I would recommend that to anyone who's maybe struggling a little bit. If you're finding like that you enjoy working by yourself on whatever it is, but there's a little something missing. You need a little extra motivation or a little extra from someone else, whatever it is. Uh, to find a to find a, a partner to move forward with. Now the one tricky thing about that is um, figuring out what is if you are making a company, figuring out what is the right way to divide up the company, divide up responsibilities, and divide up ownership of the company. And I would recommend waiting to do that until you actually have worked with your partner or partners for a little while to see who is actually actively doing the work and who is doing what work, so that you can have the most accurate, equitable division of, uh, of labor and equity, which is something I discovered kind of the hard way. I talk about that a little bit in this chapter. Um, let's see, Molly says, her game has kind of splintered into two different games rather than become too heavy. That's interesting. Would it be a mistake to cultivate both and see which one progresses better or should I focus on one now? Um, Molly, my, my favorite thing to do, or the thing that I do on an ongoing basis, is I always have two games in the works at any given time as a designer. And so it works for me. I don't know if it would work for you, but I, I really enjoy working on two at a time because that way, if I'm really excited about one on Tuesday, but I kind of maybe overwork myself on it or I need a break from it, I still have something else that I can move forward with in the other project on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. And so I, I would give it a try give it give splitting it and trying both projects but uh be very aware of which one you're more excited to work on at any given time and give yourself permission to actually work on it and put the other one aside try that method i don't know if it works for everybody but uh give it a try and let me know if that works for you george says would i consider this to be a mistake now or would you do it again okay so george is asking about the tier where i offered uh, for viticulture the original viticulture to go uh teach the game to someone else as a reward tier. And I would definitely not do that again. And one of the main reasons for that, other than the time and the whole strangers thing, is um, that I found rather quickly that if a friend was excited about viticulture and wanted to learn it, I wanted to teach it to them. I, I wanted to be there to show them this game that I was excited about, that they were curious about. And yet I had another friend, this a friend or a few people, who paid for that. And so all of a sudden, I kind of feel guilty about doing this thing for free because I asked someone else to pay for it. And of all the things of teaching your game to someone else, I don't think you should ever feel guilty about doing that, uh, about teaching your game. Um, or at least I, I feel like I shouldn't feel that way. So 
uh, really, as soon as I had that experience, I was like, okay, I, I don't want to ever charge someone for this again. I don't want to charge anyone to ever play a game with me ever again because I want to get, play games with other people for free. Like, I am not worth paying to play a game with. I'm just a person to play to, who likes to play games. I hope I'm kind of stumbling through this a little bit. I hope, I hope you get what I'm saying, that figure out what you, what you just like to do in general. If you want to do something personal like that, choose something that you truly would not want to do if someone wasn't paying you for it. And while you're thinking about that, think of, um, think of someone in your life that you value and think of them asking to do that same thing, um, but, but not paying you. And that might help you realize that this isn't something that you want to charge anyone for. It's just something that you generally like doing or want to try to doing or want to have the flexibility to do whenever you want instead of making it a service that someone has suddenly paid for. Yeah. Dusty just popped in here. Um, Dusty says, uh, has enough change since you wrote your book that you consider doing a second edition? I know you have the blog and it's full of great information, but is it worth the effort to revisit the book? Dusty, you know, at some point maybe, but for now, that's actually one of the motivating reasons for me to do this book club that I, I didn't really want to write a second edition right now because I do have the blog. I do have a lot of other stuff going on, but I wanted to look at the book from a modern perspective and look back at what I wrote then and see if it still applies today. Yeah. So this is kind of, this is the second edition. I'm talking through it right now in real time. So I already talked about going cheap on art and graphic design. Um, yeah, one thing that I did before, one early mistake that I made, not engaging the industry and community before the Kickstarter campaign. This is something looking back that is so surprising that I did because I did a lot of research for the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and I even, I backed a bunch of projects. I was following a bunch of projects, but I didn't get involved in the board game community. I kind of stayed outside of it. And by that, I mean, I wasn't actively participating in any Facebook group or board game geek. Um, I wasn't really going to meetups. I kind of, I waited until I had something that I wanted people to support before I did that. And I think that was a pretty crucial mistake that I made. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think it ever works out well when like the first time you introduce some, yourself to someone that you are hoping to get something from them. Uh, I kind of wish I could go back to my, my self back in, in 20, 2011, 2010 and say, you know, this is an awesome community. Get involved in it, be active in it. Don't just wait until you, you need the help of the community to fund your project to show up and, and be present there. That was a big thing. I also didn't even have third party reviews before I launched Viticulture. Uh, yeah, that, that baffles me too, that, that, I, that I didn't do that. that was, that's a big thing. I'm, I'm screwing over it now because I've already talked about that, but that, I definitely did not have that early on. I'm just leaving through the chapter to see the other big things. Um, yeah, the video. Uh, yeah, I talked about the video a little bit. Oh, one, one other thing I'll talk about in a second, but let me look at comments and I'll get back to something else. Uh, let's see here. Krista said, did anyone buy that option, the pledge level where you teach the buyer how to play? If so, how many? Chris, I, I don't have the projects. I don't have the Viticulture campaign up in front of me right now. Um, I recall, I know for sure one. Let's see if I can load. It takes a long time to load for some reason these days. If I try to load the Viticulture Kickstarter... I'll see if I can get it up. Okay, here we go. Nope, nope, this is the, that's Tuscany. Let's see if I can get the very original Viticulture campaign. Okay, it might take a few clicks for me to get through, but I'll try to find it. Um, yeah, we'll go back and look at that pledge level. And one other huge mistake that I almost made on Viticulture, that I know that I did make on Viticulture that almost sunk the project and my company as a whole was that I offered a stretch goal for metal coins. Um, and I didn't budget it out properly. And if we had hit that stretch goal, so I, I basically, I, I was offering something really expensive as a free thing for everyone to get if we reached a certain funding goal. Um, I didn't math it out properly. I didn't run the numbers. And if we had hit that stretch goal, I would have been in a world of hurt financially because it would have been a significant increased cost. Um, so I, I got very lucky with Viticulture then. And so one of the biggest mistakes that I think that I made and that crowdfunders still sometimes make are not budgeting properly. And for me at that time, getting caught up in the moment of the excitement of this project is doing well, we might actually reach this goal. I'll throw something awesome up there, but not doing the proper math to see if we could actually afford it. So let's say I have the project page up in front of me right now. I have a bunch of crazy rewards on this thing. Um, I have a, 
I have a $9 reward level where you unlock some MP3 downloads of, of the song featured in the video. I, I don't know why I did that. I, had a, I have a $25 reward level where I said that I would promote any Kickstarter campaign, cause, or product that you're passionate about. I love the intent there, but that has nothing to do with Viticulture. Um, finally, at $39, I have Viticulture on here. Uh, I at $65, I had a full uncut sheet of cards from the game that no one backed. No one cared about that one. I had some combined levels. Let's see. Okay, yeah, here we go. $149 includes two copies of Viticulture, two copies of the expansion, four Viticulture wine glasses, and the backer's choice of either me or Alan, my, my uh, co-founder, will attend your game night with you and your friends to teach you how to play. Mutually agreeable date in St. Louis, Richmond, or Kansas City. So Richmond is where I'm from orig originally. We're now in St. Louis, or I'm in St. Louis, and Alan is originally from Kansas City. Uh, four backers. Four backers back that one. Um, yeah, four backers. I, I think only one person actually, uh, I, maybe the, the other ones were family members. I think one was a family member, or at least a couple of them were, but one was a friend here in St. Louis. Yeah. Molly says, can being too active in the community be a detriment, like being a t being typecast as a fan and not as a designer or peer? I don't, I don't think so. I, I assume you're getting at that there, Molly. Um, but I, I don't think it's a detriment. I, and let me put it this way, Molly, and I'll use you as an example here. I don't know you personally. I, I've seen you in these live casts. I've seen you in the, in the Discord channel. Um, I, I love how active you are with Stonemaier Games. I think that's awesome. If you ever submitted a game to Stonemaier Games, not that, I, not that you should, and you might want to self-publish, you might want to send it to another publisher if it's a better fit, but if you ever were to submit a game to Stonemaier Games, you wouldn't get preferential treatment or anything like that. But if you emailed me and said, Jamie, um, I know you're not involved in the beginning part of the submission process, but I did just submit a game to you. Um, just want to give you a heads up. Uh, because I can recognize your name and I, can, I, I, I will know at that point, oh, Molly has been pretty active at Stonemaier Games. She, she knows the types of things that I like that I talk about in terms of game design and game publishing. I need to check this out. I think that's a huge advantage that you have. Um, for whatever publisher that you end up choosing, um, if you end up trying to get your game published by a publisher, uh, I hope you see what I'm saying there. I think you have you have a leg up if you are visible in the community, especially for publishers who might consider your work. Um, beyond that, it's the it's the merit of your of your game. I it, I would I would look at your game through the eyes of uh, is this something that I really love that I would that I think will will do well um, on the market that I think would bring joy to people. Is it innovative? All those other things I look for for the game. But to, uh, for, many, for all the hundreds of games that we get submitted that Alan typically goes through, um, the ones that, that I end up looking at in particular early on before Alan does go through that filter are the ones that, uh, for people that I kind of recognize who have been active in the Stonemaier Games community where they aren't showing up for the first time um, with a submission. And I know that's maybe a little bit unfair to those who aren't active in the community, but they still get a fair shake. Alan still looks at all those submissions and looks at them from a pure merit standpoint. Um, but yeah, Molly, I get long answer to that, but I no, I don't think it's a detriment at all. But Dusty says there was even higher pledge level. Uh, there was a, there was a nine hundred ninety nine dollar reward level, zero backers. <laughs> Jamie or me, or Alan or me, flying anywhere in the U.S. to deliver the game in person on a mutually agreeable date. Your pledge covers our travel and expenses. No one took me up on that pledge. I'm so glad they didn't. Um, but that would have been an adventure, I think, to deliver the game in person. That that would have been surreal if anyone had backed that that reward level. I, I forgot I put that there. So many so many crazy rewards on this original. If you want to look at how to not structure a uh, a Kickstarter campaign reward structure, look at the uh, look at the original Viticulture Kickstarter campaign back in 2012. George says, "Did you work with Panda for the first Viticulture Kickstarter? Was there Panda at that time?" And yeah, actually, I talk about that a little bit in the chapter. Um, Panda was around, and. Yeah, I talk a little bit about Panda here, like how they how they caught my eye. I tell a little bit about Panda's story. Um, Panda was around, yeah, and we I worked with Panda from the start. I got very lucky there. Dusty says, 
uh, with Pendulum, it appears there's a slight advantage to presenting a playtest at Stomar Games Design Day. That might be a get around Allen loophole. There's a little bit to that as well. Yeah, if, uh, I, I don't want to give any, like I, I know not everyone can can come to Design Day and there's even a limit on attendees because we uh, we hosted at a place called Pieces Board Game Cafe and Bar, but there is a limited space. Um, but yeah, it is a time for me to physically see games in action. And so we have signed a few games that that showed up at, at Design Day for sure. So that is a, a little bit of an advantage there. Chris says, you'd probably be more successful at selling personal delivery now that you're well-known. Back in the day of Viticulture, having you deliver the game probably wouldn't have impressed anyone. And I hope it still wouldn't. Um, but you're right, Chris. Maybe, maybe it would be a little bit different today. But I wouldn't want to sell that. And I think that's the key here. Like, only sell the things that you actually want to sell. Um, I, 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 didn't, I don't want to sell myself as someone who shows up and delivers game. I don't want to sell the Jamie delivery service. Um, but what I, and again, going back to this idea of, of selling versus doing things that you just already enjoy. Sometimes when I travel, I haven't traveled a lot in the last couple of years, but sometimes when I travel, if I'm going to a certain city or location, I, I might let uh, ambassadors say in that area know that I'm coming and see if they want to play games with me while I'm there. And the last thing that I'd want is to charge them for that privilege. Like that is such a, a weird thing for me to conceive of. Rather, it's it's my honor to play games with them and for them to, to choose to, to host me or to come to a game cafe or, or a game um, a gaming store where I might be and to hang out and play games for a little bit. Like that is that is my honor um, that really I should be paying for in some way, not uh, not the customer. So kind of kind of learned about that that mistake over time. Let me say that a few other mistakes here that I'll mention on my little sticky note here. I talked about budgeting, important. Um, communication, I think communication, uh, having clear communication during the campaign, being an active creator during the campaign is really important. Uh, scheduling, really, uh, I don't know if this matters as much anymore. I think backers are seem very forgiving about uh, missed schedules at this point and estimated dates being way off. But uh, the, be the better you can schedule, I think, the the, the, be the better I think a project can be received if you can schedule accurately. And last, early birds and exclusives. If you look at this early Kickstarter campaign, I did have some things that I originally labeled as exclusives. I think I had an early bird reward level two. I don't agree with the pa my past version of myself at all about those things. I, I don't like early birds or, um, or exclusives. I, I much prefer, uh, if you are gonna do any form of like, Get, trying to get backers to join you for the first 48 hours of the campaign, do something that benefits all backers, not just those people that showed up during that time. And for exclusives, instead of doing exclusives, just include some cool stuff for free in the campaign and offer it as promo material after the campaign or box it up in an expansion and offer it for sale after the campaign. Uh, don't I don't like stuff that's exclusive only to that one moment in time, especially if it's a product that you hope will bring joy to a lot of people for many, many years to come. <laughs> All right, I, I laughed at Chad's comment. He says, waiting for the board game cover art for Jamie's delivery service. Reminds me of uh, Kiki's delivery service, the, the Miyazaki film. I think that's it for today. Uh, I, I have many other mistakes I, I am happy to discuss over time. I, I'm sure more will come up in future chapters here and that I can talk about in more recent years. I, I continue to make mistakes all the time and, um, and I typically write about them on my blog so you can avoid them, but I'll try to bring them up, those up more modern mistakes in, uh, in future discussions. George says, come to Romania. I'd love to come to Romania someday, George. Chris, thanks for your time today. Everybody, thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks for these questions. Dusty, Molly, uh, Matthew, Garrett, I, I won't name everyone, but thank you for joining in. I really appreciate that. And I'll throw this video up on YouTube to continue the discussion there. I will see you again in, I think, two weeks will be the next book club. Chapter five, what are we talking about next? Make it about them. Oh, yeah, I love this philosophy. Make it about them. Uh, if you launch a project, don't make it about yourself. Make it about the people who are showing up to support you. Look forward to talking about that in two weeks. Take care. Have a great day. Great week. I will see you later. Bye.